Hello, producer Arty. I'm Jazz Glarty, and welcome back to your favorite place to grow as a dentist. In this episode, we're discussing additive equilibrations for managing tooth wear. So this is an occlusion-based one. Dental students and young dentists, it's a lot of things that we discuss that might stretch your mind a little bit. So if you're new to the world of occlusion, you might have to listen to it a couple of times. You might have to hit the books. You might have to speak to some mentors. It's okay to listen to something that might be a little bit beyond your depth at this stage. Certainly, when I was learning inclusion, I had a lot of that, and I slowly, 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 you know, gained more knowledge, spoke to more mentors, gained new perspectives. So, just because we cover some themes that you might not understand in this episode, doesn't mean you shouldn't give it your best shot. Now, on that note, if you are looking for some basic but powerful, impactful, actionable. And practical occlusion tips, then I've set up a free monthly resource right to your inbox, starting from August. So it's, it's worthwhile just joining now. If you head to www.occlusion.wtf, that's right, it's www.occlusion.wtf. Listen, I'm on a mission to demystify occlusion. So with this very practical gem that I'll send you every month, I'm hoping to go a long way to help our peers. So do check it out, sign up, and I look forward to sending you some occlusion goodness. In this episode with Dr. Carlos Sanchez from North Carolina, USA, we discuss treating the worn dentition with something called the additive equilibration technique. So people think equilibration is usually when you get a, a burr and you start drilling teeth away. Well, this is additive equilibration. We are creating the quote unquote ideal occlusion or ideal occluding scheme by adding, for example, composite or ceramic or whatever it might be to get to our ideal restorative results. So it's not so much equilibration as you may know it before, it's additive, it's restorative. There are some themes discussed similar to the dial technique, which is quite refreshing because in the in USA, it's not used as much. So it's nice, nice to hear an American dentist, Dr. Carlos Sanchez, talking about the dial technique in the way he did. So I know you'll enjoy this perspective. If you listened to the last few episodes with Dr. Javier Queros, you know how much I love the KC instrument. Well, actually, Dr. Sanchez invented this instrument. So uh, it's something that's distributed by Cosmoden or Enlightened Smiles in the UK. And I've raved on about it already. I'm not gonna go again but I want you to check out all the other instruments that Carlos has made. They're really amazing. I'm gonna show them off in the clinic. The other thing I found on Dr. Carlos Sanchez's website is the Vacu Grip. This is like $10 for five of these little things. And let me tell you why I, I fell in love with it, because I've got one now. So, you know when you're washing your ceramic, so you've etched your ceramic maybe with a hydrofluoric acid for 20 seconds, like your Emacs, for example, and then what I usually do when I hold the crown in tweezers or my glove and I'd wash it and I make sure that I wash it over the sink and that the sink has got some wet tissue paper inside. And the problem with that is it's over the sink and it's away from where I was initially uh, and it's to get a little bit messy. So what the vacuum grip is, is a little insert, a little plastic insert that's got foam inside. That fits nicely into your suction. So I try this by putting the crown into the vacuum grip, which goes in your suction. It's like a little tiny black plastic piece. And now I'm holding the vacuum grip, the entire unit upside down, and my crown is not falling. So it's like extra gravity. It's, it's sucking the crown so that it's not gonna fall out. So I can even turn it all upside down and the crown will not fall. So you can imagine that when you're washing your ceramic, now you can do it into the vacuum grip and the crown's not gonna go anywhere. And it's a nice and safe way to do it. So check out uh, the vacuum grip and all the other products that Carlos Chances has, has on his website. That's estcon.com. Again, I'll put the, the show notes on the, the website, protrusive.co.uk, and on the YouTube if you're watching there. So you can see all the awesome instruments, including the KC and the vacuum grip and all the other lovely brushes uh, that he has on his website. There's some really brilliant instruments that Carlos has invented. So he's a true uh, innovator when it comes to in instruments and dentistry, and I hope to share some of those with you. Today's Protrusive Dental Pearl is how to use PTFE. So for example, we use PTFE in so many different scenarios. And one of the most annoying scenarios is when you are preventing the etch and the bond from contacting the teeth that you don't want it to touch. So it's a great way if you're doing um, onlays, you're bonding onlays or resin bond bridges or veneers or whatever, you know. I like to floss some PTFE into the contact so that now the etch won't hit that tooth. But the issue that we have in this scenario is that 
unless you are with your finger and thumb holding on to the PTFE, it gets hoovered into the suction. It makes that horrible noise, which is not very pleasant for your patient uh, and it gets very messy. And it's not so nice. It might even pull off your PTFE or just make that horrible, unbearable sound, which I absolutely hate. So there are a few ways I've seen some dentists manage it. They often get some liquid dam or some flowable composite and they sort of tack cure the composite onto the adjacent teeth to keep the PTFE there so it doesn't get sucked away. But what I found really easy trick that many of you probably already do is once you've placed your PTFE and then you manipulate it onto the more distal teeth, I will then floss that PTFE through a more distal contact. So if you're watching the video here, great, you get the idea. If you're listening, just imagine you put some PTFE through some contacts and now you're extending it. So let's say you put it between the premolars, lower left first and lower left second premolar, you put it there and now you're gonna extend it on to the first molar, maybe even to the second molar so that it's, it's long enough to, to cover all those teeth and then you're gonna floss it between the first molar and the second molar. Now that you floss that PTFE in that area, it's no longer gonna get sucked into your suction and it's not gonna make that horrible noise and it gives your PTFE some security and some resistance to being sucked away. So it's not gonna make that horrible sound and you get to keep that PTFE in the stable place. So whether you keep the PTFE there the whole time or you remove it after your etching and bonding. It's up to you, obviously, how you want to do it, but uh, it's a great way to keep that PTFE stable. So I hope you like that little pearl, and let's join Dr. Carlos Sanchez to talk about all things occlusion and additive equilibration technique. Dr. Carlos Sanchez from North Carolina, USA. Welcome to the Petrusa Dental Podcast. How are you? I'm doing great, Jazz. What a pleasure, man. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm with the Petrusa Dental Podcast, so it's a joy. Well, it's, it's, it's great to have you. And it was amazing, again, to find out that you're also someone who listens to the podcast. And you're and, and as we had a little Zoom session uh, a, a few weeks ago now, just to catch up and learn about each other's interests and stuff. I mean, your occlusion background really interests me. Your sort of reflective practice that you've been doing uh, in, in North Carolina. I think you said you've been in the same practice for many years. Is that right? 27 years. Well, tell us about yourself. Tell us about uh, your, your practice and uh, tell us about your journey within dentistry and occlusion. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to disclose my age. No, you're going to. been practicing 30 <laughs> years. I'm a general dentist, and, uh, but I'm a geek. I love all facets. I'm not into the academics, but I definitely like to get in there. And, 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 and you know, I, as I do my stuff, I make sure that it is science based. But um, I was in the military for about three years. That's where I got my experience and everything. My wife is a dentist. But long story short, um, we were able to settle here in Kannapolis, North Carolina. Love the environment. And from there, I journey into different entrepreneurship with practices and so forth. And interesting, just leading to the occlusion, you know, you get out of school. I was very fortunate that um, Iowa, I get from the University of Iowa, I'm going to shout out to Iowa. But um, I, they, <laughs> I felt comfortable with giving me a, a pretty good foundation. Not perfect, not perfect, but a good foundation. So I thought when I got out there, it's like, okay, I'm going to get out there. I'm going to rock and roll, do this and that. Three, four years into it, guess what? I got burned. <laughs> I got burned. <laughs> uh, I learned my lesson. Uh, there was a particular case that I did some crown lengthening on top and bottom. Uh, nothing the posterior. The gentleman left. Long story short, it was a journey. A, a good year with the insurance. I, I didn't get sued or anything like that, but I learned. And I learned and I said to myself, you know what? I don't want to catch myself in this position again. And so that propelled me. That's how I started um, in this journey as, as far as occlusion. And uh, well, what what happened in that case that made you think that, OK, I need to go back and, and uh, do further learning inclusion? What, what was it? Was it failure? Was it premature failure? Uh, what was it? Two things, actually. Lack of my communication with the patient. That was, in other words, I just assume. And um, I didn't explain myself well enough. And, and I'm just being candid with you. That was, that was That's very humble of you. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, um, that was one. The second was was that um, I think that was the big picture. The, the second one was staying in touch with him because he moved. So basically what it was is worn dentition, top and bottom, missing from, I know the nomenclature is different from the U.S. and, and, and Europe and everything, but from the canine bags, he was missing those very short uh, like so. And so naturally back then you do crown lengthening, build them up and so forth. I didn't pay attention to my, this, this angle right here, the, this, the decoupling and the exclusive angle. Looking back, I made it too steep like this. 
So I didn't pay attention. So, so too, too steep of an anterior steep guidance, that, like rather a than shallow it. Envelope constriction. Yeah, the envelope, the envelope of function. I there was a uh, I violated the envelope of function. I constricted it rather than open it. I constricted mm. it absolutely. And so he moved to the beach, and that's where I got the letter saying that um, you know this whole case needs to be redone and, and so forth. But long story short, there were some good colleagues. That's why you know as colleagues we have to be attentive, you know, help each other out. And there were two gentlemen over there that evaluated the case as Carlos. You haven't done anything wrong. Everything, it's, the only thing was, you know, the posterior, we needed to build, build them up and so forth. And my thing was that since he left, uh, there was no way I could do it. I even uh, proposed to the gentleman, I said, well, well, come over, whatever you need to do, I'll do it. So long mm -hmm. story short, that was the big aha. It's like, okay, I got it make sure that um, as I move and progress in my evolution and, and, and my field, that I don't do this, you know. You don't want to make the mistake again, uh, make it more mm -hmm. predictable. And so I started my journey with Panky. I remember Panky for a whole week. Um, I, I didn't finish the whole Panky because it was such a long process. I uh, did the Peter Dawson, uh, listened to uh, Spears, uh, did Spears, uh, let's see who else. And then I was very <laughs> blessed to meet Dr. Bill McCorris. He's an ethologist. This is how, mm -hmm. and you know, what I call them is they're, they're the ones, the foundation for prosthodontics and so forth. You know, it, those, those are the guys like say you had B.B. McCollum, you had uh, Stewart and Styler. They're, they started the whole, this whole journey of occlusion. Well, then, Carlos, you, know, you, you mentioned some real big hitters there in the, the field of occlusion and dentistry in, in general. A question that I get a, a, a lot is how do you, Pick. Now, I really admire, like many of my guests who I've had on, what I admire is that they haven't just listened to one school of thought and then ran with it, which is fine as well. There's nothing wrong with that. But a lot of the guests I've had on are very privileged that, okay, they've done Coist, but they also did Panky, and then they listen to Dawson, and they respect Spear, and they and they listen to everyone, you know, and they develop their, their protocol that works in their practice. Um, how does a young dentist choose which path they will go for first? And do you think it matters so much exactly, you know, between Spear and Coist, who they end up going for first? No. You know what? I, I, I think, the, and this is the hard part, I think, in dental schools, is understanding the basics, you know, the anatomy and the physiology. That's the most important part. Because if you look at, you know, there's different, you have the CR camp, you have the LVI, neuromusculature, you have those. Um, and, and we can all agree that, you know, you want simultaneous contacts, guidance, that's forth. But where they vary is where you start, which is joint, joint position. And mm -hmm. among those is joint positions, how they get there. And to me, it doesn't matter how you get there. Just get there. You know, once you get there, <laughs> just get there. You know, if you want to use a coise D program or use it, I'm a leaf gauge, you use a leaf gauge, use a cotton roll. Just get there, make your diagnosis <laughs> and move forward. Right, and then how do you put the stuff together? Well, how do you, you know you got uh, respect that uh, a Kois Kois is his mentor was Dr. Bill McCorris. Uh -huh. because we had a long talk and everything. He was from the Air Force. One, he's an incredible clinician and everything. But you know he has a certain way of where he likes to start in the posterior. There's nothing wrong with starting the posteriors. I I like to start in the interiors because I think that I kill I, I I do more I get more from the as far as the aesthetics, phonetics, I test the joint if I start at the front. But, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. start at the joint, once you get your diagnosis, then it's just a matter of what you have in your toolbox to implement the final result. And always start from the end and look back. You know, look at the nice pictures and look back. Don't get intimidated. You're very much, Carlos, you're very much echoing the same thing that, uh, you know, we did a two-part episode with uh, Dr. Bill Supple. He's the uh, president of the AES. Have you been to the AES before? I, mean, I'd love I to have go. not, but one of these, I have Man. not. I'd love to go. Maybe 2025. I, I kind of, I, it sounds crazy thinking so far ahead, but I'm just, you know, a family man and I'm just thinking kids and stuff. So I'm thinking, I've actually earmarked 2025, uh, Bill Supple will be there. And I said, okay, I, I kind of told him, 2025, um, I might see you in Chicago for AES. But anyway, what he said in the episode was very similar to what you said. Like, look, the end point 
between all of them is very similar and they all care for the patients and they will all, if you follow one of them to a T, you'll get a good result. It's just how you get there and the, and the little micro steps will vary. That little squiggle from the point A to point B will, will vary, but the point A and point B are, are invariably the same, i.e. getting the correct diagnosis uh, and being able to communicate that to the patient and then getting the something that you're proud of and the patient is going to be able to uh, get longevity from is is the same. So I'm glad we we, we you know we covered this again because it's important to remind ourselves. We get very we get very worked up about oh, but your coice and your panky. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. You know, I was one of those back in the at the NX, um, and I tried it. You know, talk to it's it's like politics and religion. You cannot convert anyone. You know, you just can't. So, <laughs> but no, but 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 with the in the occlusion is the same thing. You know, the occlusion. And here's one thing, and I'm going to say a couple of things about nathology that that I'm a little biased, a little biased. I want to keep things simple. Well, you know, joint position is what we start. We do our diagnosis, right? Um, but as far as finishing the cases, we're not worrying about the lateral and the central. We're just worrying about the coupling and and the interior. You know, the envelope of function. So unlike, for example, and, and of course, a lot of the viewers know this, uh, your traditional Pinky Dawson and so forth, you want 28 contacts simultaneously. Well, my friend, it's hard to get freaking 28 contacts, especially in the interiors. <laughs> and you got it. And it's hard. I mean, you're going to, there's just no way. Okay. Now, I'm not bad. I, and I'm not going to bad mouth that. There's no way you can tripodize the whole full mouth in nathology. There's no way. But the beautiful thing about this, if you understand the big picture, understand the stabilizing the tooth, it doesn't matter under, just stabilizing that tooth. Then with that, you the, first of all, if there's instability against with the patient and everything, if you start stabilizing one or two teeth, it's amazing how the body starts saying, oh my gosh, I think this guy knows what he's doing. The body does, right? And then you start seeing some progress. So what I've learned in my 30 years is, Know the big picture, but you then you can pick and choose. Some patients don't have to go to the nth degree. You only need to do one or a couple things. You know, adjust a non-working interference here and there, and bam, they do well. Another person, the other one you may do is before you get started. You and I know this is before you start on a posterior. Make sure where the first point of where is the first point of contact is, because if you change that. Depending on how that patient reacts, some people have wide zones, some people have small zones. You can put a rock on me, and I'm fine. <laughs> my wife, you put something there, it's like, oh my God, what have you done? So you have to be able to have that in your toolbox so you minimize your problems, right? Right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, what we, 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 that's what the thing is. We want to minimize the problem, and we want to look good. We want to look, look good in front of the patient and so forth. And so with nathology was that, yeah, they're they're way to con they're way on the right time. I'm gonna call I'm a liberal nathologist, and I'll explain I'm a liberal nathologist. Because yes, I understand the tripodization, I understand this pharoidal disclusion, yes. But hell, I can't do that all the time. But what I realized if you can do it one or two, bam, it's amazing how that patient does. Now, so so really, what, um, just to just to really make it clear to those listening and watching, our uh, dear listeners, the Patricia Ronti, when you say stabilize a couple, just what do you mean by stabilize a few teeth? Like, just make it really uh, tangible. Like, uh, describe what you mean by stabilize. All right. In that I mean, context, an example, an emerging. I had a, a patient that came in, uh, and I have it uh, documented and so forth. Woke up with a pain on the right side, lower right side. Um, it came to me and just was distraught. Was just, I'm, I'm hurting the muscles, hurting me, and, and the whole nine years. So my thing was, okay, let's take a look at this. How am I going to start with this? I, I'm like I said, I'm a leaf gauger, so I always do the medical history and, and so forth. Because that, you know, that's another topic with med, with the medications, increasing muscle activity, blah blah. So naturally, she's there was a reason why she was having an issue. That tooth was some in the way of her function, whether it was clenching, grinding, and what have so it was unstable. So I come in, go go to my, my leaf gauge to check out how the joint, the muscles, and the teeth are. I get the teeth out of the way, check the inferior helato tear, go to deprogram it, see where it is in position, right? And then from there, with the warm compress, figure out how she does. And I also use pressure point release. I think we talked about that earlier mm -hmm. on. It's, it's a modified dry needling. I just go straight to the source and just, just put it in because that breaks up the lactic acid. Well, so with so that said, you're using a uh, like a I like just a use a 27 needle, gauge. Needling? I just use a 27 gauge needle. My my, my uh, yeah yeah. And yeah, I just take a, a wipe it down with with alcohol, 
And I'll tell Mrs. Jones, you're gonna feel a little pinch. I'll find where the tight contact is. She still leave, she has a leaf gauge. She's pumping that muscle. I'm checking it. I go in one or two, warm compress, wait five, six minutes, go take a cup of coffee, do whatever you need to do. Come back and you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised how the patient, so naturally on this particular case, that uh, on the right side was number 32, uh, 31, was, had a distal buckle uh, fracture and it wasn't stable. Now you had one, a gentleman, I haven't tried this back in the day where you can put it, you can add to the, I need to, I need to do that. But my thing was, is I, w I went to the front, stabilized it with the canines. I added, that was my first point of contact. There was about a millimeter or two, went ahead, used the leaf gauge, created my vertical, used mm -hmm. my restorative adhesive, placed a composite, and immediately she was able to respond. Why? Because no longer was she coming in straight, lateral, in the non-working interference was already removed because you have the interior, you know, I mean, the so, so, so essentially you created a more harmonious occlusion, as, as they say in the textbooks, by uh, removing the posterior quote unquote interference uh, so, that, so that that tooth was no longer uh, taking all the brunt of the uh, parafunctional forces. And then you, you, you created, uh, you, you recreated some form of anterior guidance, right? That's it. That's it. That's it. Interior. And I use the canine. Now bring it back again to the nothological is what's the beautiful thing about it. All I, got, all I got to do is worry about the canines in back for, you know, equal contact. And for the interiors, what the, the purpose, the, the function of the interiors are there for disclusion. They're not, they're not completely touching. They're, they're, they're ready and set for disclusion. So as soon as you move, you therefore boom, you get disclusion. Left and right, you get disclusion. That creates a liver three system. It's the least mm -hmm. mechanical offensive. Right there it is. Anytime you have a posterior interference, that's a class one, that's a seesaw. You have the joint mm -hmm. and the muscle, they're gonna be sore. And especially, remember, have you ever seen a, a when patient comes in and they have wearing the canines and you wonder why they're wearing the canines, you know? This happens at night, sleeping postures. So if, you sleep, mm -hmm. if you're a left side sleeper, you're gonna put your head like this, your jaw goes this way, and you're gonna wear this. What's gonna happen? This joint is gonna be the, the uh, painful one. That molar back here is going to be your fulcrum, like, you know, your number 14, 15. And you're going to see canine wear on the opposite side. Now, if that person toss and turn, you're going to see on both. And what's beautiful, I have documented cases that patients in the back, you barely see a little bit of wear in the front. Because I'll ask them, are you, are you, the teeth are very revealing. Let me put it this way. The teeth are very revealing. They'll tell you how stressed they are and everything. Just think about it. Because, you know, uh -huh. we're using it 24-7, those teeth, and so forth. So, leading leading to, to the nothological... Uh, but before, is, before, you, before you progress on the nothological, I just wanted to make a point that I actually posted a, an Instagram story, maybe a, a few months ago, uh, and it was just like my, my nurse, who's been working with me for almost two years now in this practice, so I joined just post-pandemic, uh, or just middle of the pandemic, I guess, uh, and she's been amazed at, exactly at that finding that you suggested, whereby you can predict the sleeping posture of, of a patient based on the wear patterns on the teeth. So, uh, my success rate in getting, in getting this right is about yeah, 95%. So you would think that if I guessed left or right, it would be 50%, right? But it's that 95%. And even then, I think some patients just get their left and right confused, really. And I know, and I actually know which how they sleep. And they, they, they might start one way, but in the middle of the night, they go to the other way. So essentially, if they got more wear on the right side, they're probably sleeping on their left, and they're grinding away from the mattress to... And it's amazing. When you start picking these things up, it's, 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 the patients start getting freaked out. Yeah, like, how did you know that? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just tell, and you just tell your, your significant other. Now, if, if that patient comes in and you have an issue, because a lot of time, you know, a lot of time, eighty percent of the issues with the muscle is all muscle induced and so forth. We don't have to do a lot of stuff, you know. Um, mm -hmm. What, and that's another stuff you don't have to do. But you educate the patient, you know. You take a walk to oxygenate. You 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 give them a, a little deprogrammer in the front. It doesn't matter what if the cotton roll. You can put a cotton roll. You can use anything. Mm -hmm. yep, uh, yep. Warm compress and sleep on the other side and have your, your mate sleep on the other. Because you don't sleep facing each other, right? So you tell them. <laughs> you tell them you sleep on the other side, right? Yeah. You don't, you don't. <laughs> so anyway, so yeah. And and so, you know, going back to, to, to the, um, as far as the occlusal scheme. Yeah, the, the occlusal scheme is I only have to worry from the canine's back. 
So that's beautiful. I don't have to worry about, you know, getting this perfect. Don't get me wrong. I mean, don't get me wrong. You want to have a, and, and I'll, I'll, I can show you, I'll share videos later on. You yeah, can show yeah, it there, yeah, sure. Whenever you want. You, you can, you can, you take the, you take the uh, articulating paper and once you do the canine guidance, you slide, it just, you automatically create that coupling and that minute disclusion or no contact that is necessary because just think about it. If you put all the teeth together, it is hard. If you have a little interference, a mesial incline or the upper one against the distal, a little, it's gonna push you forward. Guess what happened? Teeth are gonna spade you. Lower teeth are gonna be sensitive. So it's important, it's important to have that little neutrality, that, that little space in there. Because we're not perfect. That inevitably we have that mesial drifting. When we're born and teeth set up, we have a mesial drifting. That with mm -hmm. with the the teeth are not perfectly. Nobody's walking with CRs and MIP equally. No one it is. So inevitably, mm -hmm. you're going to keep going forward and you get this thing like this. What's beautiful is when you get mobile teeth and you add to the canines and so forth, is how things start tightening up. Hygiene improves. It's insane. Now, this is not, um, and I'll lead slowly to the, to, 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 to the canines. Um, my thing through my process of Peter Dawson and all that, you know, they said, okay, oh, I remember Tanaka, Terry Tanaka, a great, incredible. If anybody wants to go see him, for the guy's insane. But I remember he's saying that um, don't ever make non-working interference adjustments when you mount them unless you have canine guidance. And it makes so, it makes so much sense because you've been too aggressive. You know, anytime you start cutting away mm -hmm. without having interior protection, you're cutting away teeth to structure. So that's stuck in mm -hmm. my head. That's stuck in my head. Two, when I, with Bill McCorris, with the leaf gauge, you know, he, he's a big leaf gauger, and uh, he's the one who made it popularized. And, and now, 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 unfortunately, you know, Peter, when Peter Dawson uh, passed away, they're starting to use it a little bit more in their camps. Spears uses it. You know, one thing when they say... It's, it's a great tool. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge to fan of uh, leaf gauges for about six years myself now. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's great. You know, and when people say to me, you know, people, oh, you're going to posture, uh, uh, posteriorize uh, the, the joint or that. Distalize the condo. Distalize the, you can. Or whatever, yeah. You can. I agree. I agree. Past the relaxed length of the inferior lateral pterygoid, that's as far as you'll go. You can't go mm -hmm. any further than that. And all those Plus things, the, the vector, the, the masseter and temporalis, the, the anterior temporalis, the, the vector that is made, it, it won't allow your condyle to go all the way back. Now, in a, in a very deep class 2 div 2, you're probably a little bit mechanically disadvantaged there, so you just got to be a bit careful, right? But um, yeah, on the whole, in most cases, it's very safe to use. And for a lot of dentists, what they tell me is that their occlusion, their, their journey in occlusion became a lot easier. And they were able to, to progress in their journey once they were able to get a leaf gauge. Because a lot of dentists, when they're starting to think full mouth, they really stumble on, you know, the looser gauge and then checking, then verifying the contacts. Sometimes uh, CR is like what Ian Buckle teaches one of my, um, he teaches Dawson in the UK. So he's, he's, he's a buddy of mine, a really fantastic dentist, great communicator. And he says, uh, centric relation uh, is like playing golf, okay? You're never going to get a hole in one every time, okay? With, with the leaf cage, you get like 90% there, right? And then you get your temporaries, and then you get a little bit closer, and then finally you get it uh, in, in the hole, basically, okay? So the leaf cage is, is, is that first swing that gets you almost there. And sometimes you get fully there uh, if the patient's relaxed enough. But if there's few engrams in there, muscles are upset, it still gets you closer to where you need to be. Would you, would you agree with that? Oh my God, 100%. And, and here's the thing, going back to the diagnosis and the muscles. Now, you know, and the engrams you, you mentioned is, you know, naturally we have this neural stimulation that we, our muscles develop this, this pattern. And with the leaf, with the leaf, as like you say, you separate the posterior teeth and they, in the eighties with Williamson and so forth, they showed that, uh, you know, you, sh you don't shut down, but you reduce the electrical component of the mass or medial pterygoid, you, you know, you climb down and so forth. But what you're also doing too, is you load in the joint, right? You load in, by putting everything in the front, you load in the joint, you test in that joint. Is there mm -hmm. any inflammation? Is that caps on the lateral side and everything? And I want to say one little thing about the, the joint because I'm a geek. I want to share this with everybody. Let's remember that the capsule is made of dense fibrous connective tissue. And what that means, it, it has mesenchymal cells and it has the ability to reshape, re, reform itself. All we have to do is create the right environment. So what do we do? We do the diagnosis and then we create the environment. Okay, so that's the patient has uh, a dislocated disc and so forth. You put the leaf gauge, within a minute or two they're crying, 
you take cotton rolls, put it in the back, because remember this, the center point of here is the first molar. The first, what's the first tooth that comes in in the permanent? It's the first molar. That is the, that is, that creates, that is your center point. That creates your guidance and mixed dentition, your guidance is your first molar. Anything mm -hmm. back of the first molar, you're decompressing the joint. And I don't care what people say, you can decompress. With my experience of 30 years, I put something back there that feel better, it's good, right? <laughs> and, and if I put anything in the front, anterior to that, you're loading the joint, okay? And, yeah. and if it, a lot of times it's the maso medial tergo or the inferior or the lateral tergo, the inferior head tergo that is tight, that is tight. And what you do is it releases. It, 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 it releases. What you when have it to releases. do, mm -hmm. it releases. What you have to do is be patient with the leaf gauge, especially if somebody has come as symptomatic and so forth. Is you pump that muscle, you pump it five, five, uh, five to six seconds, like Rocco Bottle said. There's something magical about six seconds pumping and release, pumping and release, that makes that muscle finalize the contraction. You know, it, it releases. And so, mm -hmm. if we understand the disc, the disc is like. Man, we don't need to go surgically in there. Just provide the right environment. Okay, so somebody has this problem. However, take a full appliance. Here's the other thing. You take a full mouth guard. I, it, I don't care whether it's segmental, just a full appliance. Create the most pivot in the back. Don't go, don't, don't go, in other words, don't bring the jaw forward. If you bring the jaw forward, you got two parts out of position. You got the jaw forward and you got the disc out of position. You got two parts. I don't want to mess with that. Mm -hmm. Stay home. Just decompress it. Wait monitor that patient, monitor that patient so that the pivot is in the back, nothing's in the front. And I'm telling you, the younger that patient is, you get remodeling of that disc and it's beautiful. And then you can rock and roll. Then, you, you know, a lot of times they need ortho. That's the other thing is, we don't utilize ortho that much. Orthodontics mm -hmm. is underutilized and it's, it's unfortunate. But that's the thing about the, the, the disc that I want to make sure is, if everybody can get that, pay attention to the disc. All you have to do is make your diagnosis, and then it doesn't matter what appliance you use. It's like colleagues, well, I use this appliance all the time. And in my mind, I said, hmm, really? A, okay. a lot of the studies, Carlos, that are done on appliance type and, and, and generally TMD and uh, conservative care, giving, you know, educating the patient, home therapies, analgesics, and occlusal appliance, physiotherapy, they all show consistently 80% plus success rates. And it's not so dependent on the appliance type. So I completely agree with you. A lot of appliances will, you know, just disrupt the system, disrupt the neural links uh, and help the muscles heal. And it's great that you mentioned the muscles because, yes, we talk about the disc, but but the superior lateral pterygoid attaches into that disc. So a lot of the issues are, are, are muscular based. So once we can calm those lateral pterygoid superior and inferior down, then the, the disc has an ability to, to potentially return to where it wants to be. Yeah, Rem remember the disc sits here and the front, the disc you have, you have the superior head or lateral pterygoid is the top, right? And the posterior you have the bilaminal zone, the elastic connective tissue. And it's meant to go, you know, it, it, it is a component that goes down and back and so forth. When you're treating, like TMD, you're, you're treating, you're, you're targeting the inferior head lateral pterygoid. It's the lateral pterygoids that you're, you're trying to get. Those are the ones. Those are, those are, the, those mm -hmm. are the only muscles that is- They are the troublemakers. Yeah, they're the troublemakers. <laughs> that, and that's what you have to gear your, your therapy. And so if you understand this, this mechanics, and the mechanics is very simple. I just, everybody, put here something, you load the joint. You put something back here, you decompress. You make your diagnosis, however you make it. If it's joint problem, Target your therapy to be in the back. If it's mm -hmm. muscle, target your, your therapy to be for that. And that's it. And it doesn't, you know, people say, oh, use this. Well, use one, use one orthotic. And based on that, you make the adjustments. And remember, mm -hmm. the joint always trumps the muscles. It always is. What mm -hmm. happens is you get a, co a combination here and there. But what happens is in a true joint uh, that I've seen in my cases and everything, when in doubt, start in the back. When in doubt, on your appliance, start in the back. And then, then what's going to happen is if your appliance is too thick, the interior portion of temporalis is going to say, hmm, it's going to, it's, it's, you're going to find out this. And then, too, the massive media doors are going, to, are going to be tight. But you can load the joint, and it's going to be fine. Then you say, Mrs. Jones, I got you covered. 
Now we're going to move everything to the front. You use the same one. You cut the back. You put the front. and say, go home. Come back. It's oh, that was pretty good. There you go. So essentially, just to make it very tangible for, for listeners, watchers, uh, in this primary joint patient, you uh, decompress the joint, use uh, an appliance that is uh, thicker or, or more involved posteriorly than anteriorly until you get the joints to make some sort of healing and then you uh, convert it to, to provide some sort of anterior guidance uh, to relax the muscles. So as you said, joints first, then then muscles. But you, And I'm sorry to interrupt, Jazz, but on the posterior, what you have to do is use one, the most posterior tooth, the palatal, the most posterior, use that as, as you pivot. So in other words, yep. what's going to happen is, is you're going to use the maxillary. So the bottom, you, you, you're going to use an upper appliance, most likely. I, I, I use lower appliance for, I, I use pivot. But if you say, for example, if I was somebody came with TMJ, I use a full appliance. I want to make sure that the most buckle functional cusp of the bottom one just hits my top, the posterior, just one little point right there, and just skate on that. All you want to do, mm -hmm. and you don't want any, you don't want anything in the front because anytime you hit anything in the front, you load in the joint, and you're going to put pressure on the joint. Wow! Wow! That's this why. This reminds me. We had uh, Dr. Andy Toy in episode. I think it was 38 or 40. We talked about the PGO, posterior guided occlusion. So it's very similar. The concept of the PGO appliance to what you're saying. Just for those of my listeners who remember that episode, very similar. And I use the PGO appliance occasionally for primary joint patient. But it's great that you, that you say that. Uh, in the interest of uh, moving forward, um, Carlos, anything you want to add to this before we now talk about uh, additive equilibration? Yeah. Let's, so. Um, no, no, because that's that we can get in another world. Now, in my evolution with nathology and, and so forth was I started noticing, you know, how am I going to treat these patient, patients that have word and education, people that come in. And so with Tanaka, I said, don't do non-working interference and so forth. And then Dr. Bill McCorris, he's, he's, you know, using the lift gate. I said to myself, well, first what I did was I started putting composite where it was worn down. That's, that was my first thing without using lift gauge, And it was a failure. It was a flop. Why? Because I didn't have a reference point. I didn't know my vertical. I would just add him. The patient would come back. He would knock it off. It, didn't feel, it, it was a mess. But I didn't give up. I didn't give up. And then I had an epiphany. So, well, why don't you use the leaf gauge? The first point of contact says, ah, that's naturally there. You know, that it's a natural point. It's, and then I evaluated the interior overjet. I started evaluating. And this, I just started slowly. It makes sense, you know. If it's way too much like this, it's going to be an ortho case. That was another thing, and I, I know I'm going fast. I had this lady, four or five years in ortho. Poor thing. She comes to me, and she goes, um, can you, you know, I've been in four years. Um, I want to get my teeth corrected and so forth. Can you help me? So I put the leaf gauge. You know, she's already like this. She went boom like that. Mm. And I said, dear, you're a surgical case. That should have case. been a surgical case. Exactly. Yes. You're a surgical <laughs> case. Time. So yeah. I called the orthodontist. I, I called the orthodontist. I said, you know what? You've done. I know that. But, you know, if you really want to, you want to present it in such a way. If you wanted this, this could be orthodontics. Just remove everything and let's, fi let's figure this thing out. Okay. Here's a little tip, Pearl. N no one can afford, uh, afford, you know, correct this. What you do is use plastic. Use a segmental appliance and at night you create your ramp so that when you sleep you get exclusion. I learned that one from mm -hmm. my from my course. So not everyone has to be crippled and 24-7 use your posterior teeth. So if somebody is like this, you stabilize the back and I, I know I'm jumping. Uh, you so just to make, because you're doing visuals, and I just want my audio listeners, if someone has a very large overjet uh, in their uh, centric relation, so if they've got a very large horizontal slide, uh, how would you, yeah, how would you, with, with issues and who may not be able to, it's not the right time in their life to consider surgery, what are you suggesting for that patient? Just make it, make from 6 through 11, making a, a segmental 6 through 11, a little plastic splint, and put and and acrylic, and yes, and you create your ramp then and you just adjust it. And that's it. But that's for that. But that's for nocturnal use only, right? That's for sleep use. That's for nocturnal use you, only. Yeah, right, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, nocturnal, not during the day. Because you know what? How many times do the the, day, the, the teeth? If we use our teeth as functionally intended, we won't need it during the day. We don't. Their teeth don't come together only when you swallow. Even phonetics, you don't. So, so you really don't. Or do those the patients who have, who are parafunctioning because they are clenching, grinding things that they shouldn't be doing. So, no, we're we're very much cut from the same cloth. I, I completely agree. What I do in some, some of those cases is I I do tell them use it for about an hour or so in the afternoon, uh, depending you, you get the segmental appliance. But you have to make sure you adjust it 
to the vertical of the posterior. Don't leave them open because some people love this thing. And if you wear 24 seven, guess what? Your posterior teeth are going to super erupt. So make sure you Absolutely. have, you know, you work out the occlusal scheme on that. So canines, I had no success with just adding. Then I had an epiphany using the leaf gauge. So there, that's where everything just changed. Go to my leaf gauge, find my first point of contact, evaluate my horizontal. Can, can you, you know, I, uh, Carlos, I, I mean, I, I just want to stop you because um, I, I'm loving the drug. So now we're talking about a journey of additive equilibration. And uh, a common question, again, I get is when you're using the leaf gauge and, and the, 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 Carlos, I mean, some, you're so advanced in your journey now that you've been doing it so many years. Uh, the, the beginner dentist, the, the first stumbling point they get, believe it or not, Carlos, is how do, how do I know how many leaves to use, right? And I'm like, it doesn't matter. Just stick enough in to disclude the posterior teeth. There's no magic answer. It depends on, obviously, the skeletal uh, stuff. But just put enough in to disclude the posterior teeth. Is there any guidance that you want to give on uh, uh, that? Yes, I'll give, I'll give you a couple of tips. Yes, good, good. that's very good. Process. So depending on which one you buy, they're, they're 0.1 millimeter in thickness. Each one is supposed to be 0.1. So, you know, 10 is supposed to be a millimeter. With that said, is arbitrarily, arbitrarily, you select the, the amount. I usually go from 20 to 25. That's my, my starting point. Usually 20, depends on, on the body scale. Now, you put them, you, you have them put them in, you have them slide forward, slide back, just, just, to, just to keep it in place. And then you're gonna have them squeeze for five seconds, relax for six seconds. Why? Because you're, you're, if, if the inferior hilarial pterygoid is tense, you're gonna start. You're gonna working on, on. You're working on that on the inferior hilarious pterygoid. It, it's it's the masseters and temporalis and medial pterygoid that are contracting, which then should give the cue to the lateral pterygoids to say, "Hey, you, you guys are needed here. You guys need to relax." To relax. Yes. Yeah. Um, w when I think of the leaf gauge, because I'm always I'm, I'm I'm thinking of the inferior hilarious pterygoid. But yes. Um, you, 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 the electrical activity, the anterior temporalis, master medial pterygoid are slowing down, and then also the inferior head lateral pterygoid is also relaxed. Because remember, the inferior head works opposite of the superior head. As the inferior head contracts, the superior head relaxes to allow the disc to come forward and back. But anyways, mm -hmm. so you do that. Now, what's going to happen? Here's the pearl. After five minutes, let's let's assume you use it for five. Let's say you five minutes. The patient is in the lift cage. Go and look and tell them, if you feel contact in the back, add some more leaf gauge. Because my experience has have told me that what happens is, yeah, the, as the inferior head lateral pterygoid is relaxed and the condyle seats, you get a, the posterior contact, more, more, more noticeable. As the condyle is seating further, distalizing. Right. Uh, not not dist distalizing is the wrong word. That's like, no, that's, that's it's, arty, just arty. Seating. it's just the lateral pterygoid seating. seating. It's, seating. Like, it's, like, seating. Like, it's sitting. It's going home. It's, 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 it's getting yeah, home. Yeah. The door is open, he's getting uh, home. Uh, <laughs> but, so it's, that's it's, yeah, important yeah. because what happens is that if you're too quick with the leaf gauge, now, if somebody's not having any pain and so forth, yeah, within five minutes. But but if you if, if you have somebody suspecting uh, muscle problems and you really want to work on this mounting the case and so forth, then my thing is pay attention to the thickness after five minutes. If the patient is not hitting in the back and go back and check, check. Check with the articulating paper. You put something in here, and they say, "Oh, I'm I'm not hitting at all." You go back there; they are hitting. Right, mm -hmm. So go back and check. I I like to look in there. It's, it's it's like a game before I start. It's like a game, you know. So I think it's this patient is going to hit on the left side first, you know, or depending on the rotation. So I make it a game for me to get which one's going to be the first point of contact. <laughs> but here's the thing: is after five minutes, check and see, make sure there's no clearance. Now. Once you have the first there's point no, of, Make sure there's no contact. Make sure there is sufficient posterior clearance. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Just posterior clearance. So muscles are quiet. Everything is good. You look at the canines. And then that's what you have to make. For me, four millimeters is the maximum for the novice, for the novice people that I'm going to start adding composite. But let me also regress a little bit with, with the leaf gauge. If for those that are don't feel comfortable and you want to get in there, there's nothing wrong with the patient Put the leaf gauge, get behind the patient, like Peter Dawson has said, and then just get a feel for it and get used. Have the, have, have the assistant hold it and you get a feel. And, and, and that, that's how I developed my sense of manipulating the joint because I remember going to Peter Dawson over there, you know, romancing the joint and so forth. You know, you need a talented dentist and you need a patient that's very cooperative. 
when the leaf gauge yeah, came on yeah. board, I used both of them. And then now, you know, it's just the leaf gauge. Oh, sometimes you can get them right. I, I'm not going to go there, but you can get somebody in there. Because remember, centric, what is centric relation? It's a muscle-induced position. You don't put the patient in centric relation. They go there. The inferior helato mm -hmm. has to relax, and wherever the condyle goes, that's centric relation. Now, the question I think, is... I think Pascal Mania uses the term uh, passive deprogrammation. So it has to be passive. Like You, you cannot lead them there. You cannot for, definitely not force them there. It's the muscle that will lead no. them there. Relation, a centric relation should not be forced. Should not, it's a muscle induced. You get the teeth out of the way with the leaf gauge. The inferior helato relaxes. You're home. And wherever that, that condyle is, that's where it is. You know, people get, oh, talking about the joint and everything. Well, uh, uh, you know, it's an anterior, posterior. I don't care where it is. I don't need, as long as I know that I'm there and it's, and I can load it and everything, that's all I care about, my clinical part and, and so forth. So, You're so right. One of my mentors, uh, Michael Mokas, he says that, you know, we get very worked out about, you know, exactly the, the you know, the 7 o'clock, 12 o'clock, all that kind of stuff position. We, 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 you know, the only way you can verify is by getting a scalpel and, and cutting and then peeling it back and saying, ah, I'm there. You no know, one's going to do that. So therefore, you go with your signs from the muscles. And, and, and again, it's your first record you're taking. You have an ability to verify and, and uh, refine in the future. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so... You know, with the leaf cage, that, that would I'll be. Don't, don't, don't be afraid to use it. Uh, you're not going to cause. And and it, here's the thing. And I'm going to give another tip. If the patients, as you're using the leaf cage, you tell the patient, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to put this deprogram on the front. This is what's going to happen. You're going to feel some tightness. What they do, they're going to feel some tightness. It's going to be okay after five or six minutes. It's going to go away. If it doesn't, usually if it's a TMJ or capsulitis within three or four minutes. They won't like it. They hate it. And then, and then what you do, because Mr. Jones, you know what? Okay, I got you covered. Take cotton rolls immediately. Put them in the back. Don't have them squeeze. Just relax. And guess what? Pain goes away. Now, you just make the diagnosis. You got, you got some, mm -hmm. some type of capsulitis, synovitis, muscle. And treat that first before you go doing your, you know, measure twice, cut once. And, 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 you, and, and you work with that. So... Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, okay, so you, 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 you use, I'm trying let, to... Let, let's just, you, you, you described the leaf gauge beautifully, so I think a lot of people got value from that. It's a very common question I get, Carlos. Now, um, let's talk about, you have a generalized wear case, maybe, uh, and you are using your, you know, done your diagnosis, you've got your leaf gauge in, you feel as though, okay, I'm going to start adding to the canines here, as you're going to say, to to recreate some sort of uh, anterior guidance, some coupling anteriorly. Do you have the leaf gauge in place as you are doing your, your bonding, or do you get a, a wax up first? I, th I feel as so you, you do a lot of freehand stuff? You know, tell, tell us your workflow. Yeah, so let me, let, me, let me walk you through the procedure. So the first thing, we'll, we'll go ahead and, of course, depending, uh, after six, the patient has the leaf gauge, find my first point of contact. That takes time. That takes time to find the first point of contact. And that's critical because if you get sometimes when I get a little bit too quick and everything, and if I don't pay attention to that, then I'm having to adjust a lot. So... Pay attention to the first point of contact, and once you got that nail in, and everything, you look at the verdict, you look at the horizontal, and then it's going to be a sub. Then you do your restorative protocol. I, I use I'm a fourth generation OptiBond. I micro etch the canines. I micro etch it. So that's air, air abrasion. Air abrasion. Yes. Yes, sir. Air abrasion. Etch. This is again. This is with the leaf gauge in place, or is this is just you? No, 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 no. This is out. This is how, but okay. I don't have them close to the. the uh, I don't yeah, have so they the cannot catch their teeth together again because of the muscles. No, and no, because then you activate everything. Right. No, you activate everything. No. You have to, you stick your hand in there and you work with your assistant, but you don't have them close down. You don't do that. Once you have, you've done your setting up your, your restorative, your teeth, you've gotten them prepared. Edge prime bond, or edge bond. Here's the key, is what I'll, what I'll do then is I'll take a piece of plastic. This is the most expensive part. I'll take a piece of plastic, <laughs> lay it over. When I put the composite, I'll put the composite, put the plastic over it like that. And then uh -huh. I put my leaf gauge on top of that. Have the patient, now, here's another pearl. Have the patient bite on their back teeth. Because in every way, if you say bite down, they'll go forward, they'll go back. What yeah, they'll yeah. yeah. practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Practice like Re you have to and coaching. Coaching. You have to coach your patient. Coaching, guiding through coaching. Now, I also use cotton rolls. I have three cotton rolls. Buckle and each side, and on the lingual, I'll bend it and I'll put the cotton roll just to try to con contain the moisture. 
Then I'll put this, put the leaf gauge, have the patient bite on your back teeth. Imagine biting on your back teeth. They're going to bite down, leaf gauge on, plastic in place. My assistant's going to come in and light cure it. Boom, boom, light cure it. Now, but just to, just to verify, because I'm kind of seeing where this is going, because I'm trying to visualize this way of doing it, because it's, 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 it's new exposure to me, just this exact way of doing it. Usually I'm led by a wax up and stuff, so I appreciate the, the free hand, the, the A, the complexities of it, but B, I'm loving where it's going. So, But uh, you, you, you're not adding, com or you're not planning to add composite where you'll have the leaf get, this is, we're talking sp specifically the canines here, right? Just the canines, just the canines. Just, just the canines. canines, okay. And and then, and the piece of plastic, you know, for the guys to describe it at home, it's like a, it's like thick cling film. It's like, it's like clear mylar, it's like a piece of wrapper. It's like a, a candy wrapper or something. It's a very thin, <laughs> clear plastic. Yeah, that's the most expensive okay, okay. part. It takes a lot. Of <laughs> Okay, so you do you have composite on both the upper and lower canines, like an uncured? Good question. Yes, it varies. Usually, let's assume an easy case, the, the overjet is not that great. So I'll just use the, I, most of the time, 80% of the time, I'm just adding to the lower ones. Very seldom mm -hmm. I add to the linguals of the posterior, unless they have a really steep, you know, a big overjet. All right, so most of, let's mm -hmm. say 70, 80%, I'm, all, all the actions is on 22 and 27, just the canines. Those are the canines. Well, that's it. So what happens is... And, and, I hear, and the, 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 the reason for using the, the wrapper is so that the upper and lower composites don't stick together. It's just some spacer. Oh, that's right. that's spacer. Right. And, and also for saliva control, even though try to yeah, control yeah. My, my, my environment. So I don't want saliva getting all over. So what this does okay. is it protects... Uh, it doesn't allow the saliva to get in there. Okay, mm -hmm. it minimizes. Okay, okay. Let me let me put it this way: it minimizes the contamination of, of composite. I know, I know. There's people that does it without this plastic thing. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I like the plastic, and and however you want to do it. Let me put it this way. But the yeah, key yeah. is this. Yeah, yeah. Now here's the other pearl: is based on the thick on um, the first point of contact, the vertical. That's how much composite you're gonna use in the front. So you don't have to put this glob in there. So say for example, you have about a millimeter. Just take about a millimeter, millimeter of composite. Now, also pay attention of how the canine is. Because just the, th the same thing is, is you, you don't want to put, say, if, if you put it on the distal side of the of, of the canine, it's going to push your jaw forward. If, if you put it on the mesial, on the bottom one, gonna put, so pay attention to the position of the canine where you need to put the, the composite. That's another, pay mm -hmm, attention. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. when in doubt, just put it over, use the Cassie instrument, that Cassie instrument becomes so easy. Just put it in, left, right, left, right, put the plastic, bite down, light cure. Now, when you remove it, you're gonna see a blob of material and you're gonna see a little edge on the side. Before you do anything, dry it up, put some floorable composite, put a little bit of floorable composite. Then, if you've done your homework and, it's, and you've done your vertical correctly, have the patient bind down, and what the patient's gonna feel, I'll tell the patient, Mrs. Jones, as we do this procedure, when you first close, you're gonna feel two boulders. I'll tell them, you feel two boulders in there. You got two rocks in there. Now, we're gonna go in the back and see how it is. So, if you've done your homework, you take that you, and check in the back, and you still have the first point of contact, which is usually the mesial incline of the top of one against the distal incline of the lower one. That pushes you forward, okay? So I'll go back there and I'll adjust it. And guess what? Everything drops back. Okay, so you're adjusting, you're ad are you adjusting the posterior interference? The first point of contact of interference. Now, some mm -hmm. people are gonna say, oh my God, that's heresy. He has mounted the article, you know, have mounted the case and what is gonna happen in that? My experience of 15, 10, you know, what I've been doing this, I've yet to cut any, anything. So, you know, for those that don't feel comfortable, that's fine. But what I'll do is I'll adjust that. And then what happens is the jaw drops back. It just drops back mm -hmm, a little mm -hmm. bit. And, and you say, Mr. Joe, how does that feel? He goes, oh, that feels pretty good. They still feel kind of a little heavy. And then what you do is you come in and you just shape it. You just reshape it, reshape it, make sure. Because you, you don't want it because of the plastic, it gives you some irregularities. So just shape it. Polish it up. So you're using just soft flex discs and that kind of stuff, right? However right. you want to do it. Yeah, however you want to do it. Now, this is interesting. I will probably say 40% of the cases, this is crazy. Once I adjust this, everything, because remember, the muscles are like your shock absorbers. Everything's resettled. And a lot of time, guess what? Catches, 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 catches. Everything is balanced out. Anterior, because I have the spacing. I have already have my right. 
boom, you're ready to go. I mean, you're, you're, it, it's it, it's amazing. It, it is amazing. Other cases, now here's it. Other cases, you'll get a unilateral, everything is contact, and you get an opening here, right? Unless you have bridges mm-hmm. and so forth, that's different. But but I tell the patients, it's okay, I'm going to have you come back in two weeks. I usually follow them up in two, four, and eight. By then, by the eighth week, if one tooth has not Settling, you choose what you want to do. You can put composite, you can or just leave it alone. You, you can leave it alone. You know, one one tooth may not. Now, what happens is you may ask, I mean, well, J- J- Carlos, just to complete the visualization here, you're sending the patient home now. So compared to their pre-operative state, you're sending them home with uh, four canines, uh, polished, polished and built four up. Or two. Um, four or two. Not, not four all the time. Four or two, yes. Yeah. Agreed, agreed. Four or two. You haven't yet done anything to the incisors. Uh, and other than maybe just uh, gently adjusting the posterior first point of contact, you haven't really done much to the posteriors. So this is kind of like, we spoke about on Zoom about this before. This is kind of like the start of a dal concept, dal technique. Uh, and then when you see them again at two, four, and, and eight weeks, you said, what are you checking for? And what's the next steps from there? So what I'll do is the following is I'll check a document and say, okay, let's, 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 here's the worst scenario, one scenario, just canine guidance and I'm not getting anything. There's space in between them. Okay. That could happen if you don't pay attention to the first CR. So what I tell the patient a lot of times is I'm going to put you in a diet. I'm going to tell them, I'm going to put you in a diet because they're going to be hitting on the canines, right? So you're going to go home, you're going to go in a diet. I've only had one patient that came back and says, Carlos, you got to, you got to take this thing down. And I did one page and I remember that. But most of the time we tell them, Mr. Jones, you're going to go. And, and what's interesting too is within 48 hours, uh, maybe, maybe three days at most, everything is, it feels fantastic. So sometimes when they walk out by the office, because when they come back, they'll say, yeah, Carlos, as soon as I left, I felt good. But so I'll tell the patient, you're going to feel the boulders. You, you, you're you're going to leave. You're going to come back. When, when I come back, I'm documenting really well where they con- where they they feel the where the space is and where the contact is. So let's assume there's no contact at all. In two weeks they come back. They may say, "Oh, I feel a little bit snug here, a little snug." Usually very posteriorly. Usually the second molars, first molars, right? And first three molars. molars would probably be the last ones. Yeah. So I feel I feel that now. What I'll do is this. This is subjective. If it's very pronounced, because depending on that height is, and it's a mesial or uh, mesial incline of the upper, let's say distal, I may take it off. I may. I may remove it. If not, just leave it alone. Okay, check the other ones. Then have them come back, like I said, in a month from there. So it'll be two, four, and eight. Then you may, on the other side, pick up contact. Why? Because of the dog principle. Things, things will go mm-hmm. to the path of least resistant. The only thing that will keep you from teeth coming together is what? It's your cheek, your, your tongue, and a non-working interference. Sometimes a non-working mm-hmm. interference, that can, that can hold that tooth in, in place. Or there's mm-hmm. a study that was done a long time ago uh, because of, um, somebody told me, because of growth hormones, when you stop at a certain age, growth hormones can have a change, but that's besides the point. But, so, you mo- you're you monitoring the, the self-equilibration that is occurring. And at the end of four, four months, of, uh, four weeks, then what you're gonna do is figure out if everything is stable, do I need to add? Sometimes you just leave the patient alone. My my case have been this is is it, it, it's insane. Like half half of my cases uh, and so forth, they're within two weeks by the by by the fourth second visit, they're balanced. Now what you do have to pay attention to is how far how fast they wear these canines because this is not mm-hmm. a procedure that is done at one time. Depending on the patient, just like you worn down, you know nothing is is more stronger than your enamel. So you have to tell Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones, this is not a, a one-time deal. And you know what's beautiful? After three or f- two or three or four years, you, you say, Mrs. Jones, you know, you want this canine. Go, I'm ready. Let's, let's put some more canine. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to sell this. Yeah, uh, let's, uh, let's do uh, it. Uh, uh. Now, that's for a certain population. So just to, just to re- rewind here, uh, for this group of patients, essentially, you have done, utilized the dial technique, right? Essentially, these patients have dialed in. Uh, there was a, probably a degree of uh, further joint seating that assisted you as well uh, in this case and uh, the dial effect taking place. Uh, and then when you actually achieve those posterior contacts, 
Here's something that's not um, it's, it's seldom discussed with the Dan technique. And there's a, there's a guy called Professor Riaz Yar, uh, one of my mentors in the UK. He, um, Carlos, he's doing some amazing research behind the Dal. Like he's um, doing the module, he's doing a T scan at the time of Dal uh, placement, and then he's following up every month and doing a new T scan, uh, a new module, and he's seeing exactly which teeth at what interval come together, what percentage. Like it's amazing the level of research he's going into in this. So I, I cannot wait to to to, to and I'm. I know you'll appreciate this as well, uh, but, but 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 here's a question for you: Is that as the teeth are coming into contact posteriorly, are you worried about the quality of the contacts? Are you worried that okay, there is a, an inclined contact here, uh, or yeah, I'm going to tell you the truth. That, that, yeah. I, I'm going to be honest. No. Okay, yeah, and, 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 and you know what? That's uh, what a lot of my colleagues tell me as well because they, and I know what you're going to say next. You're going to say, as long as they still have smooth anterior guidance, canine-initiated guidance and uh, anterior, uh, the, the posterior, um, the, the way they come together, as long as there is a contact, is, is good enough. Is, would you say that's uh, the, the philosophy that you follow? Yes, um, and, then, and if your concern is, you know, with mythology, we believe in tripodizing and so forth, tripodizing, you know, um, you know, when you look at centric relation and tripodizing, that is in, a, in an ideal so ideal world where you you can have no non you know interference free occlusion and a talented clinician. You know, teeth teeth are very variable; they change in everything. But what I will do, and I think you, you had a mark one of the um, not not nathologist or child in here a while back. But what I'll do is I'll put a little bit of composite at the floor at, at the base of the fossa. So if there's if I need a little contact, I'll just add a little bit of flowable composite, and that's a create create a little bit of stability. What I look for mm -hmm. a lot is the non-working interferences when they go left and right. And remember, and you know this, when you do, when you check you for non-working interference, don't go and have the patient go like that. No, what you do is you go out and you put pressure to come back. Come, you go uh -huh, out uh -huh. and you put pressure because that's why you're activating the mass of the medial pterygoid. When you go like this. Absolutely. When you tell the patient just grind left and right, they won't recreate what they may be doing in parafunctional uh, at their worst. So yes, get them to do it with force. And also when they get stuck, when they feel locked in, you 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 guide them. Yeah, yeah. you got it. You got to get the master involved because when you clench and grind, it's the mass of the medial pterygoid. Those are the bulldogs. Mm. Those are the ones that are destructive. Those are the ones we're trying to neutralize that's, that's when we do the interior ones. We're trying to neutralize those things, you know, because they're the bad. So so this scenario, that's one. Most another scenario is when I'm done with the additive procedure, a lot of times they're balanced. They're, they're, they're balanced. It's insane. They're balanced. Okay, go. On. I'll come back one more time and check. Uh, I'll use this to check my diagnosis of the joint. I'll use this to phase dentistry. In other words, if somebody comes in, they want interior, and I have cases, and I, 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 I would love to show them, but where well, they want interior teeth, uh, aesthetics, and so forth. Well, what I'll do is I'll go to the canines in centric relation. I'll go automatically and figure out that over jet overbite. Because inevitably, if they're like this, there's something that is, unless they're a true class three skeletal position, but inevitably there's something that is pushing them forward. And it's, mm -hmm. what, what is it that, what, what, what push you forward? Three things. Inflammation here, inferior helato pterygoid, or the mesial incline of the upper one against the distance pushing you forward. And you just slowly work your way back you know, through your diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened when you use the canine, you're doing, you're testing the joint, right? You're loading the joint, so you're testing. Mm -hmm. You're testing yep, yep. the aesthetics and phonetics. You're testing the aesthetic phonetics. You're checking the, 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 the muscle, the tolerance. So you're doing a lot. You're killing, you're doing a lot of work by just confront, you know, taking care of the interior teeth and everything. So at what point do you then start restoring the laterals and incisors uh, and the lower incisors for, for aesthetic reasons? That's a good question. Now, it depends, because usually I'll have patients, because I do like, besides the occlusion, the aesthetics part of, of dentistry. And so, and I do a lot of composite, direct composite, even though it's harder and everything, I, I enjoy it. But with that said, then I'm really rock and roll with the anteriors. I'll, I'll do, you know, the laterals canine. Once I have the canines, it's up to the patient. The other thing too, is you can do face dentistry. Once you get this stabilized, you can do the top, the bottom, with composite, I do a lot of composites in the front, even on a class two, div one, a railroad. I'll, I'll build up the composite first, and then on the top, I use um, Emacs, whatever, however you want to do it. Um, you know, that's that's a personal thing. But pick, I'll pick use- Pick your poison. Exactly. I'll use this to stabilize and do face dentistry, because not everybody can afford a full mouth rehab. 
No one can. But this way, and what's beautiful about this is it gives the patient also that sense of confidence. Because especially mm-hmm. when they come in with uh, symptoms here and there and you stabilize them. And they say, yeah, yeah, this, this is, we're, we're in the right direction. And then you can start building your relationship and, and do what, you know, whatever you need to do with the patient and so forth. So with the additive equilibration, it gives me, uh, I have control and it helps me in my diagnosis a lot. It really does. It really does. It, and, and I think it's something, and it's reversible. Why? Because the patient ultimately, as they clench and grind and so forth, they start adjusting it off and everything. You do have to pay attention on your recalls for the non-working interferences and so forth. You do have to pay attention and so forth. But all you do is just... And, and what are you doing with uh, when you find non-work site interferences? Are you just uh, adding more of steepness uh, into the canines or are you happy to just uh, adjust the, the non-work site interferences? And if, if so, any guidelines to help a novice dentist when they're adjusting those? Here it is. If you're a novice dentist, and I, I, I'm going to try this, what you want to be careful is make sure you have canine guidance before you make those non-working interferences, remove them. Because what happens is, is you could open up a Pandora box but start adjusting in the back without having any, a, a, any stability. So you got to make sure that the patient has enough potential for because some patients, they, they, they don't even have because they have an anterior open bite or, or, or severe crossbite, whatever. They don't have the potential to have it. And therefore, you shouldn't start to, to adjust posteriorly when you haven't planned that. OK, what's going to happen anteriorly? Right. And if you don't have coupling, anterior coupling or canine mm-hmm. guidance, do not make any non-working. Effect. On a class two, you know, on a class two open bites and so forth. Here's one thing I'm going to also share with my experience is. I, I gave you the anterior night guard. What I've noticed, even if you don't do an anterior night guard, if you balance, and I know you have the T-scan too, and I love that. It. It's, it's fantastic. But um, in the posterior, if you can balance out those, the first point of contact equally, you'll be surprised how well they do it. It's not to say you don't need anterior guidance. Please, please, please. But, you know, just to get them, get them uh, stabilized or having issues and so forth, and you can't get them. You start with, with flowable composite and with this and just have him bite down like here and adjust it, just balancing this back from can I back, you doing that patient a lot of big service. And then after that, you can start planning on, you know, doing your restorative part, crowns, bridge, what have you. But I am now, I'm not afraid to tackle class two, div one, posterior first stabilizing him. And, and then also too, remember, remember what, what the mechanics of this, uh, uh, of the lower jaw, the teeth is. As long as we keep the genial Howard uh, muscle behind the canine, so that means I can go to the premolar, but as long as you're behind, you still have a class liver s- system three, and you can mm-hmm. use it. So you can use that as your guidance. You can use the upper first, first premolar against the lower canine, as long, remember, as long as you're, you're using the lower, can, the, the lower canine is behind the muscle. You understand? So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you can use a premolar for guidance as long as, that, you know, using the canines. Uh, uh, use the canine. You're still behind. The muscles behind the uh, canine, the 22 and 27. Remember that? There's a Gino Howie. There's a turbo pole. There's a turbo yep, pole. Yep, and yep. Gino Howie is the most interior muscle that is in there that, that pulls down. Okay. So, so what you're saying is that you, as long as you're on lower canines, you can be on uh, upper premolars against lower canines and a class two div one, for example, because you're still encouraging a th- class three lever uh, with the muscle. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Now think about this. Remember, you know, this about orthodontics. I know I, I jump around all over, but you know, when you take extractions, and that's why I'm not big in extracting uh, baby teeth for ortho, because what you're doing is you're narrowing it. Not only are you narrowing for air space, but mechanically you're putting that patient at disadvantage. You're moving everything closer to the muscle and to the genitalia. That's a that's almost like a class two, class three system. So you know, back in they don't do it that much now. But the last thing you want to do is don't take teeth out and bring back. No, you want to always expand. Why class three people don't have as much problem as as class one or class two? Because they're further away from the folk back there. Come mm-hmm, on, it's all, mm-hmm, it's all mm-hmm. the mechanics. That's what it is. And, and if you understand that, then, then you open up. I mean, everything is just like you, 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 you're not cutting this little little thing. You, you understand the whole thing. And, and it, all it is is the mechanics, the mechanics. 
That's all it is. Carlos, you've given us a, a, a lot oh, to think about again. Energy. I loved it. Uh, no, it's been amazing. I've enjoyed this journey. Now, uh, just on a point uh, before we start talking about uh, uh, the other side of, of your uh, dentistry, the very uh, inventive side about instruments and stuff. So I'm, uh, I'm going to just, uh, just uh, you know, discuss with the listeners about that and tell us about some of those cool instruments but not, and whatnot. But before we uh, get to those, I just want to check one more thing. Last question. Um, on those class two division ones, uh, increased overjet and you got your leaf gauge in and they might become, they probably will become a little bit more class two. In that case, yes, you can maybe use the upper premolars, like you said, and get some sort of a class three leverage there in a way. But how do you maintain or achieve anterior coupling in those class two increased overjet cases? First of all, you can because, because by definition, you don't have a class two div one. That space is so far... So they get it coupling. You have to do it indirectly with plastic. That's the first thing. You have to do it with plastic. Either surgery, ortho, ortho, bring it forward, or mm -hmm. you have to do it with plastic. Now, okay, that's that's the idea. If for some reason you want to go you know, forward, you cannot physically get, you know, they're going to look ugly. So you just go to the canine, and at night you protect them with that segmental uh, appliance. Six or now, mm -hmm. one thing about class one, div one, they have a narrow angle it's a very narrow they they cannot tolerate stuff in in, in the in night guards they, they, they can't tolerate that so you, and they have their they're very notorious for popping and clicking too and those are the ones that you have to be very careful with class you know class two division ones those, those you have to be very careful when you when you go in there and doing restorative measure twice cut once and that's for another side that you really have to be careful with those um, because you can get in trouble. They have a lot of clicking and popping. They have a lot of uh, muscle, and, and it's just because they're narrow. They're narrow. They're, they're mm -hmm. coming back. They're back to where the muscle source is, like I was telling you earlier. So you have to be very, you, you know, be, be careful with those. But you can help them. You can help them. You can really help them out. For sure. And and I sent you an um, e email. I don't know if you got a chance to read this, but um, the, did you get to read about that easy peasy jig that I sent you by in China? Yes, yes. I like that. I did. I did. So, I did. so I'm going to shout out to Dr. Gurmit Hoti, uh, another you know a, a dentist I met at BDA a study club once, and he's been such a, a great person to, to to know over the years. And we email each other. Uh, he, I'm going to share. I'm going to put this in the show notes. This PDF. Uh, so, what Carlos has described so so brilliantly with so many different facets was the leaf gauge technique and how you can get the anterior coupling first point of contact. So it's not kind of revision for this episode, but uh, a different way to do it would be to use what we call the easy peasy jig, which is a great name. There's a whole you know, aesthetically, whatever is a full name, I'll get it out for you. But essentially, it's using some physical material anterior, uh, and then that becomes kind of like what the leaf gauge is doing in a way. And then that bring, makes you a stop, so they can then rebuild the anterior teeth. Just another way to think about it. So I'm going to add that in the show notes. Uh, but I just want to jump to Carlos. Tell us about how you became so inventive. Like, where did you find the time? And you're you're active. You're father of three. Uh, you're you're a, a, a very geeky dentist. How, how did you invented the Casey instrument? Which, by the way, I have talked about before. I talked about how much I love the Casey instrument. I literally, before I went on holiday, I used it uh, for a broken incisor. I love how it can, instead of using my finger, my glove finger, I'm now using the Casey. Uh, we've got that, you know, the blue um, uh, reduced sticking sort of surface, the stick-free surface, to and the correct contour, whether I'm building the platal or if I'm doing composite veneers to shape the anterior with the three planes. Amazing. And you also got some brushes that you made as well. Tell us about your instruments and stuff. Well, okay. I, I don't want, I want to talk about that. No. Uh, yeah. Basically, you know, I used to, I do my own wax ups and everything. And so in my, my lab at home, I had an epiphany uh, with the instrument. If I could, you know, create this angle, have these angles with the instrument and so forth, max, you know, make, make my life a whole lot easier. So that's how I started my journey with, with the Cassie instruments. Um, and then, of course, Cosmetin was very, they were very nice to uh, take on the instrument, and they're the ones that they're selling it for me and so forth. And then, you know, being on the artistic side, I, I, I you know, Newton, you have Newton Fall, you have Dr. Dennehy. We use, a lot of people use brushes. And so being influenced by the brushes, I, I, I told myself, you know, there's a way we can come up with a, a brush that is a handle that is not disposable. And then also with disposable tips um, that would, you know, could help out. And so I, I have an, a handle. Basically, it is sturdy as you can get, you know, stainless steel. And then with different tips on both angles. There, let me see here. 
it's like I'll show you. So you got them both sides. Sure, sure. And everything. But for those viewers that can't see it, you know, just just the brushes. And hopefully, I'm working with Cosmet and if they uh, go ahead and, and pick it up, you'll be in the market for everyone. So, but that's how it. I mean, just I'm very intrigued. I just. I, it, it, it's great that you do that and to find the time to do that and it takes a lot of time and effort to, to do these things and uh, I've got my KC and you very kindly sent me some more so I'm going to start using some some, some videos because to help a dentist to see how useful that is as well as the brushes I'm going to have a go at them and stuff so I really appreciate that uh, and I'll, I'll share with everyone how I'm getting on with that but yeah it's great to have the design of it uh, and to usually the stumbling block I had with these um, brushes in the past that becomes a very expensive habit to use these brushes but the way they have the autoclave handle and whatnot uh, and how it re reaches in the back uh, and how you can very easily create the right angle of the cusps as we were saying uh, will reduce your appointment time and includes the adjustment and stuff so it kind of makes sense so I'm, I'm looking forward to using that and sharing that journey with the Petrusrati so thank you so much Carl for making that possible well first of all thank you for you know for for the plug and everything I appreciate that and I hope you know people like it but you know I'm always if I can share. Is, I'm 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 passionate about occlusion. I think you can see it as we well that. And so you know, if anyone has any questions, they can. I'll, I'll share. I, I was just gonna say because you're so easy to to chat with on Instagram and stuff. Like, tell us your Instagram handle so that if 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 someone's doing their first case and stuff and they want to send you some photos, maybe like I'm sure you'd be happy to to help them. I would. I would. Yes. And then with you, Jazz, I'll send you my I have videos now. I do have videos with the uh, as far as I do have videos with the Cassie instruments. Also have with the additive equilibration, start to finish. I'll give Carl, those to you. Send us everything. I'll I'm going to put you. it on the Protrusive Dental Community Facebook group. I'm going to stick it uh, uh, on the show notes. Please join us. Uh, are you on Facebook, Carlos? I'm on Facebook, not a lot, but I'm on Facebook. Yes, sir. I'm going to invite you to the Protrusive Dental Community. Come and join a little, a little community of like my dentists. Yes. Uh, it's, it's somewhere where I don't, I don't, I don't invite people because the problem with these big groups that invite people is that you lose control of who's in. This is very much a club that you have to do the uh, your own work. You have to find the link. You have to click it, and then you get accepted inside. So that what what that what that breeds is a community who self-select themselves. Like you know what, I'm so geeky. I'm going to be part of this, uh, and you would be a great addition to this. So come and join the Protrusive Dental Community and then you can see the kind of stuff that we talk about and we'd love to hear about your experiences and, and, and your mentorship would be very much valued on there. I, I, you know, I want to share because I want to make life, I love dentistry so much. It's a great profession, you know that. And if we can make it easier for those young lads that are coming up and everything and help out that, you know, that's, to me, that's rewarding. So tell, tell us your Instagram handle and your website, Carlos. Oh, no, no, no. Just go through Cosmet <laughs> Go through Cosmo. No, no, but in terms of reaching out with you, how can we reach oh, out with you? Oh, your Instagram oh, handle. Oh, on Instagram, yeah. Oh, I got it. It's uh, at Carlos Sanchez underscore Casey. Carlos Sanchez underscore Casey. Uh, but yeah, join us on the Facebook as well. And uh, it'll, be, it'll be great to have you there and learn from experiences. Uh, I, I, you know, I think you, a lot of my listeners are, yeah, we're global, but a lot of the UK and in the UK and, and also in Scandinavia, we're already very intertwined and very experienced in, in, in DAL. We are the leaders of DAL in the world, right? So what you had to say will really, really catch the interest and capture to the, the sort of different ways to approach it. So again, thanks so much for coming on today and sharing all that. Uh, it'd be amazing if everyone kept up. I might have to break this up into a two-part episode. Uh, but again, thanks so much, uh, Carlos, for coming on. I really appreciate everything you did for us. Be blessed. Well, there we have it, guys. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. So a few different unique perspectives shared there, which may be familiar to you already in terms of how you might be doing your tooth wear techniques. But, but it's always great to hear how other dentists around the world are managing their patients. As I said to you in the intro, I'm introducing a monthly email for free with some videos and occlusion tips to help you be a practitioner of occlusion. So why don't you head to www.occlusion.wtf to join that free newsletter and I look forward to emailing you. Thanks so much again and I'll catch you in the next episode.